Okay, this, this morning Sarah did something different. I'm going to do something different as well. Um, I realize that beginning of the year we had quite a bit of an influx of people here that are here just very new, joined us more recently. So chances are if you say hello to someone, that person is new as well. Um, I need to revise a little bit or trying to um, explain to you what our church is on about. And what I want to do this morning is I want to introduce to you and remind you, and for those that have been here longer, yeah, revision, what's the top value of our church? Because everything is determined by values. You know, a church may have a beehive of activities, we may not just do one thing, but this top value decides what we do, whether we do it or not what we say yes to, what we say no to, and whatever we do is going to be measured whether it's actually meeting that top value. So does the ask, do you already know what that is? But uh, someone knows and then jumps the gun. Um, What I'm also going to do is, um, over the course of this, you know, our journey in this church, I've written three books that were addressing things that needed to be addressed at the time. And, you know, I'm I'm going to show you in a little while. The three books are out there. They are actually available today. Um, One copy is $10, all three of them are 20, and all of it is a non-profit exercise. So don't worry, we're not, you know, become Sunday traders now. Um, It's an all non-profit exercise. But books are helpful especially when you need to address something. And then there's also um, a DVD that we produced, uh, a bit of a documentary of what we were involved in, Lutheran Renewal. And I was at a conference two weeks ago, and the invitation came because the manager of the Kurong bookshop at Macquarie gave this DVD to a pastor, and then he watched it and said, oh, that sounds interesting. And so we got there and and shared. Okay, so with all of that, when I came to to Toowoomba in 96, so almost 25 years ago, um, I was was the Lutheran minister of two local Lutheran congregations, and it was all very traditional and liturgical. You know, I was wearing the black gown, and then I was wearing the white gown, and I had a bit of stoles there, and we had the hymns, and, you know, pretty much the same worship order every Sunday. And, you know, I basically came with the intention of, this is how ministry is done, this is how I've been trained, and it's going to work. Only a few years into the experience, I realized, and everyone else probably could realize, it's not working. Um, the church didn't grow, we didn't have a single convert. Um, the young families were slowly trickling out of church. They were bored, you know, if you really boil it down to it, and I, I understood them because I had the same feeling, and I was the pastor. So uh, after a few years of doing that, I, I was, um, oh, I mean, I had this prayer to God. I said, look, if this is all there is to ministry, you can have it back. Uh, I actually don't want this anymore. You know, it's too long to retirement just to keep doing that. No future in it. It's anyway. So my problem at the time, and the problem of, of our church was that we had no experience of God whatsoever. There we come together and we worship in His name. We we pride ourselves that the preaching is good and the worship order is good and everything we do is good. But there's no encounter of God. I I never really encountered God. I never encountered him in prayer. Prayer for me was a one-sided dialogue. The other side of the dialogue is like, it's nothing coming back. I never knew when the prayer was answered. And so I was pretty dry. And so was everyone else. Um, so no experience of God. And I remember, um, you know, we, we were quite in this condition for a few years, that we did a resource, a, a, a study in, in the church called Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. 
And that wasn't even a you know, particularly charismatic resource. But I remember one Sunday, one of our older members, well-respected, mature members, got up and you know, took the, um, had the study guide in his hand and said, Pastor, you know, when you first came and said we would int- you know, do this study, I felt like taking it and throwing it down the aisle. Because don't you know, Pastor, that for us Lutherans, the word obedience and experience are offensive. Remember that one? For those that were there? Well, we, we had a few problems. Hey, those two words, if they are a problem to you, well, but we knew what he meant. It was offensive. Well, there's, there's one thing to say, I have no experience and I'm a bit dry. But to actually prime to be against having an experience of God. That's what we were and that's where I'm coming from. Because anyone that told a story about experiencing God or any testimony, they got immediately labeled. Oh, that's a pietist. Like, I never understood the label, but apparently that's what it means. Like, ah, oh, these people experience God and, and everything else. Like, because faith... It's faith. It's not by sight. It's just believing, trusting, even though you don't experience anything. Right? No? Um, I get into that. I remember also at the time, um, because I was interested in it, I was on the Pastors Conference Planning Committee meeting, and I was able to put the topic, Experiencing God, onto the agenda of the Pastors Conference, which was a bit... You know, wow, everyone's a little bit nervous about that one. How can we do that? And so, but we had a good time and we were exploring stuff. And at the end of it, one of the older retired pastors get up, gets up and he, he says, and I want, he wanted to publicly thank the bishop for allowing this topic to be discussed. Yeah, yeah, this may be foreign to you, but this is where I'm coming from. So, you know, some values are hard won took a while to get into it, into it. So we were hungry. We, we knew it, it wasn't quite working, but we, were not, we didn't know what we were hungry for. And then God said, look, I've got to give them a bit of a hand. And God surprised us, certainly surprised me. Like, you know, we planted a contemporary church that we thought, you know, just open up a little bit more from the heart. But then God came in sideways. And I guess against my wishes, God gave me the gift of tongues, which was an experience, like not what I expected because it wasn't emotional or whatever, but you know, God said, deal with that. And then uh, a few months later, we had a guest preacher from the United States. He was originally from Ethiopia. You know, Ilum would have liked him, good black preacher, good black preaching. So he, he, he preached for maybe half an hour or something like that, and then sermon wasn't even finished. It feels like calling everyone forward for prayer. A um, huge number came forward, even though that wasn't our style. That, that's not what we usually do. And then I guess I've maybe more than 100 got slain in the Spirit, which for us was a completely new experience. Like no one saw this coming. We didn't have any catches or anything. <laughs> Like, um, it wasn't trained behavior. We hadn't seen it before. Like, but it, it's an experience, right? And so that happened, and I was catching our members because I was sitting in the front row, and like, someone had to do something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm catching them. I thought, God, what is going on here? Like, uh, what is this? A- am I in trouble now? Like, um, so you just don't really know how to take this. Um, so I go home and I ask God, like, I talk to God and say, look, it's your church. You can do anything you like, but it better be in the scriptures. <laughs> so, and, you know, it didn't take long and he actually took, took me to 1 Corinthians 2 and we actually got it up here now because that uh, turned out to be a bit of a Bible reading that kept speaking to me over the years. And if you can put it up there. On PowerPoint, here we go. Um, the Apostle Paul writing to the people in Corinth. 
He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Like, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I read that, because it, it was a favorite verse of ours. You know, the tradition where I'm coming from, we love to quote these verses, because it begins with, Paul saying, while I was with you, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Man, this is totally orthodox. This is straight down the line. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then, you know, I didn't really, you know, we never read through the following verses. We just concluded it's about Jesus and him crucified. And also, um, when God looked the weakest, dying on the cross, he was at his most powerful, redeeming the world. His blood is, you know, cleansing us from all sin. You know, it looks weak, like we do. Our own church experience is weak, hanging on the cross, and like we look defeated all of the time. But, you know, really, we are really powerful. Just not growing. Um, but yeah, that's not what the verses say at all. Like, yes, it's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and yes, He was powerful, even though He looked weak. But, you know, for people that hear that, there's a demonstration of the Spirit's power that actually brings a bit of conviction. And they have a bit of evidence. They have an experience of God. Basically means you don't just have to take the word just because someone says so. God actually backs it up. And I thought, whoa, never seen that before, which embarrassed me a little bit. And I said, okay, evidence, you know, demonstration of the Spirit's power. Well, maybe someone falling to the floor is exercising a little bit of power. Oh, and I, I was happy with that. So that satisfied me. Then there was another Bible, Bible verse, a bit similar. And uh, this one is interesting, Romans, because we're studying Romans. Romans 15, the Apostle Paul summarizes the, really how he's done things. And he's leading the Gentiles to obey God by, by what I've said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, the power of the Spirit of God. So if Paul, that is really highly intellectual and great, deep Bible scholar, and we like him for that, if, if, if he can handle signs and wonders and demonstrations of the Spirit's power, they should be okay. So, and so I was happy and moved on. And after a few years, I wrote this book. And this one is surprised by the Holy Spirit because, you know, he kept surprising us. But when the first experiences came, we really had no clue who the Holy Spirit was and what he was doing. How would you receive him? Like, what do you, you got to know about the Holy Spirit if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, the question is, like, I'm baptized, I'm a Christian, I, I know I'm born again, but am I not automatically filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, at my baptism or whatever? Um, you know, it says the Holy Spirit comes with power. So how does... Christian suffering fit in with being filled with the Spirit and being full of power. And then when the Holy Spirit comes in power and fills you and you know, you're ready to do stuff, why does the warfare increase? Now, as soon as you actually got powerful, you, you're actually fighting more than you did before. And how does it all hang together? So I, I wrote the book that I, that I needed to read myself. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we took a few years, and God also drew my attention, and this is a bit of a tangent, because, you know, when, when the first meeting and people fell down, and like, you know, they were everywhere, and it was nice orderly, like, it wasn't a wild, loud Pentecostal meeting, it was very Lutheran, very quiet, <laughs> very orderly, just like, it's not too much to be, you know, no one got hurt or scared or anything, so I didn't really pay attention to it. And I, I didn't really long to have this repeated, like, surely this is not what it's all about, that people keep falling down in church. Like, So it didn't happen for a number of years. And then we did a, a prayer summit, a national prayer summit of Lutherans. We invited them all. I think it was Adelaide. So we met there, and about 80 of us, we, we fasted and prayed for three days. So that's pretty intense. And at the end of the three days, I was exhausted, tired, sick. All I wanted was go home. I didn't feel spiritual uh, at all. 
But the last thing we were doing is people would come for Holy Communion, and on the way they would receive prayer with the laying on of hands, and I was one of those praying for people. And someone drops to the floor. And I had my eyes closed, and you know the, the sound um, rattled me, and I thought he died. <laughs> yeah, what, what other conclusion? Like, and I said, God, you know, don't do this to me. Like, he dies on the way to Holy Communion. This is, uh, um, but it, it, it turned out he was alive. And then another lady uh, had a similar experience. And then there was a third one that went down, a young woman. And like, um, I'm checking this out because it's all new to me. And it's like, I never thought it would happen to me. So I check her out. She doesn't look relaxed. She looks contorted face. Just like, it's not, it doesn't look great. And I, I'm a little bit interested in that. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled. And then words come out of my mouth. And I do things that, you know, didn't come from me. And by accident, I drove out a demon. <laughs> and I didn't even know what I was doing. I, you know, what I said was, in Jesus' name, whatever makes you run, depart now. And it departed. Like, so that was an experience. <laughs> and you know, it was sort of connected with the falling down business. And you know, now thinking about it you know, years down the track, I actually reckon they fell down, so I actually paid attention. You know, I, I was pretty ignorant about spiritual things. Like, I, 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 it took me a while to put two and two together. Like, there's a difference between praying at the beginning of a prayer summit and at the end of it. After you've done three days of prayer and fasting, you're containing more of the Spirit's power. You get infilled, and, and you know, the, the presence of God increases, and you've got more ability to do things in His power. And, like, no, I didn't, I didn't quite know that. And so someone had to drop. To, to get my attention. And um, so that was that, and I was happy with that. But you know how it goes. Like, in the beginning, you're half offended when someone falls down, and you get a bit of pressure and discontent and criticism from your own colleagues and denomination because this is really not what it's done, especially when you're Lutheran, this is not how it's done. And then you get used to it. And the church gets used to it. And then suddenly you sort of put two and two together and like, wow, when they fall down, things happen. You know, you drive demons out by accident when they fall down. So you put that together and then you think, wow, God, I prayed and no one fell down. What's... First you get offended by it and then you get, God. It's like then you want it to happen, and if it doesn't happen, you feel the pressure of it. And then, I'm not the only one like that. The congregation is like that as well. Like, you, you go somewhere, and you know they come forward full of expectation. They better fall down, otherwise they don't think anything's happening. You know, so the pressure's on, on me suddenly to make them fall. Like, push them hard, push them hard. Like, like... If it's a really nice congregation you go to, you know, they know the culture. They know their own culture. And so, not to make me feel bad, they do a courtesy drop. <laughs> it's, it gets mighty twisted, I tell you. It gets mighty twisted. And it's such an... It's, not, it's really not the main thing. It's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But you know, so first God draws your attention to it, you're learning a few things, and then you focus on the wrong thing. But I had another experience with this falling down business, because I didn't fall for years. Oh, I held out many years. Like, because someone would pray for me, like I said, yeah, God, you can do it, but got to be you, and if I get pushed at the slightest, I'm pushing back. So I, I had the... The, the nice, relaxed, aggressive stance. So you have got to have one leg back. So, and and I heard the other, you know, it's a, a while ago. One of our members, probably not here today, when she knew that there would be prayer in church, she would wear high heels. Why? Because you're leaning forward. <laughs> 
it's a lot harder to fall, apparently, when you've got high heels. So I wasn't the only one stubborn. But I, I go to this conference, um, and I'm really hungry for God. Uh, no one knows me there. About a thousand people there, and there was the pastors were called forward to receive prayer. And man, I was the first one out. He wasn't even quite finished inviting people. So I was out there, and man, I was hungry. I had my hands up. I was because I'm, I'm, it's not my church. Like um, the worship music, ah, oh, you can just be silly and crying out the. Oh, well, I do it now here too. But then they all got prayed for, and really everyone just got slain and I fell down to the floor. And you know, I do my usual thing. I say, yeah, God, you can do that. I'm, I'm so open to it, like, but I'm standing already like that. And so it's finally my turn, and I feel myself going backward. And, like, I feel my go- and then I try to do the usual thing, which is basically get my leg back, just to count, counterbalance and get, catch myself. Only I cannot go back, because someone somehow had a foot there, and I just... So I go down, I can't correct my stance, and I go down, I go down, I go down. And when I'm about here, I'm basically saying, God, I think I'm going to fall. (laughs) (laughs) And I can't fight this anymore. And I I remember saying, oh God, this is not you, but well, someone will catch me. And so I finally let go, and the very second I let go, the Holy Spirit just comes all over me. And, and then basically on the floor, you know, the Holy, I'm weeping, my body's convulsing. It wasn't really emotional, but like stuff was happening. And, you know, I was in that state for a good while. And, you know, so this is again, this falling down business. But what was the lesson for me? Let go of control! Oh man, I've been preaching it ever since. And like, in, in my experience, God is using this the silliness of falling down to get people that way. Like, when we all get used to it, I'm sure He'll do something else. God, God has a habit of doing that. Like, you get used to Him in a certain way, and then something else that's going to challenge you. But, you know, I learned that, and ever since I learned to be light on my feet, so my, my rule now is, if in doubt, go down. <laughs> so don't fight it, go down. And in my experience, it gets stronger on the floor. And sometimes it frustrates me. You know, I pray for people and the spirit comes on them just like a flow. And because they want me maybe to pray longer for them or have my hand longer on them or you know, as if it's me or whatever, they fight it and They don't want to go down. They correct themselves. And they're immediately out of the spirit. They're immediately out of the flow. And just like, ah! Um, But I can't be too frustrated because I've been there myself. Like, But it's teaching. It's teaching. And so it was connected with this falling down business. So in God's, you know, in this own little journey in our church and for myself, so that became a bigger thing. And then we had Clark Taylor ministering in this church. You know, Clark Taylor, highly anointed minister, evangelist, you know, done decades of ministry in Australia. And he came and bodies were just flying everywhere. I love meetings like that. I, I do like them now. Just, I, I like it a little bit wild, you know, not so contained. And so I loved it, I loved it, I loved it. But then, you know, I was wandering around as well and just enjoying it heap, heaps. But then I thought, man, God, this is great. Clark is here. But next week, it's back to me. (laughs) Yeah, as he would. Like, next week, it's back to me. And like, ah, I want more of that happening as well. Every Sunday. And, you know, God, when I pray, let them fly as well. Like, And they do fly, but mostly when you do conferences. Not so much at home. So, you know, there I am talking to God about this. And then d- during the week, he puts a, a Bible passage in my path. And as soon as it came in my path, I knew he was talking to me and I didn't want to hear. I said, no, I know exactly where you're going, God, but no. So, and the Bible passage was Elijah coming to the Mount 
Mount of, mountain of God. And Elijah was, you know, he, he, was a, he was the great prophet. Like, you know, when he prays, the drought happens for three years. He prays again and there's, you know, rain and flood. He prays and, you know, there's a water-soaked sacrifice lying on the altar with the whole nation watching. And Elijah prays and fire falls down. from. I, I like that kind of ministry. Like, you know, it's great. And so Elijah goes to this mountain of God and he says, God, I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Where's everyone else? And then God taught him a lesson. And, you know, there was an earthquake, which resembled more what he was doing. And God wasn't in the earthquake and he wasn't in the firestorm and he wasn't in this and he wasn't in that. He was in the gentle whisper. And then he told him, look, I'm not just operating only in this way that you're operating, I have hidden 7,000 other prophets. They're doing exactly what I want them to do and they have a big role to play in this nation. So it's not always one way. Yeah, I didn't want to hear it. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, so next Sunday I pray. I pray against a prayer line and I, I pray for Nathan. Is he, probably, he was here before, but like he's out with the kids. So I pray for Nathan, and Nathan can be very stoic, not move a muscle. It's just like I pray for him. Like, oh, it frustrated me. Like, and nothing seems to happen. Like, I pray my little heart out, and after a while I say, I just stop and say, Nathan, you know, did anything happen for you? It's just, how are you going? He said, oh, fine. <laughs> like, fine. It's all nice. It's all good. But he said, ah, but I felt this wind at the back of my legs, as you know, if someone opened the door or something. And he didn't know what it meant, but he drew attention to it because, you know, the windows were closed and the doors were closed. It was a supernatural God wind, and I knew exactly what it meant. I was meant to get this, you know, God having a wave. I did say the gentle whisper. <laughs> You know, they're not always falling, and they don't have to fall, but when you pray, just trust something happens. So I, I went full circle now. Um, I got that monkey off my back now that they have to fall. First you get offended, then it has to happen, and then you're finally okay with whatever happens. It's a bit of a journey, and I, I pray it's... But I asked that before, why do they not fall on a regular basis, Sunday morning when we pray for people, as when we do an outreach tent or a conference. There, there, I think there's a reason for it. Sorry? No? No, no, no. no. I'm fully convinced that the prayers we pray here Sunday morning are as powerful as any of the other prayers we pray in other time, at other places. No, the, uh, I get... No, I, I think the reason is very simple. You don't need it. You don't need it. Like, you know, if you're a member of this church and, you know, after, if, after everything you've seen of God, after all the testimonies that come, you don't need God to demonstrate that he's doing something. Like the falling down is actually not doing anything, right? It just means you're on the floor. Like... Really, we want the Holy Spirit to do stuff. We want, you know, depression to come off. We want to be filled with the peace of God and the joy of God. That, all of that can happen standing up. It's only when you struggle with unbelief and you don't, oh, is God really in this place? Oh, oh I'm not, you know, like, then God has got to be a little bit more showy. But you don't need it. Right? So... So this is a bit de detour with the um, falling down business. Um, then about probably nine years after this guest preacher came from the United States, 2012, if you want to know the year, we had to do new mission work. Like, you know, what we used to do um, didn't work. We had to do something else. And we had a few ideas, but none really gelled. None None really, we had a peace about it. And then I finally prayed, God, make us do mission work according to what you've been doing in our church. Just 
make us do something that actually fits our own history. And then I pray this prayer, and then very quickly, I'm taken back to these two Bible passages. And again, you know, this is nine years I've been living with those words. Nine years. And I never saw what it actually was. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, I would, While I was with you, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and, crucif- and Him crucified. I did that not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So what was he doing in those little verses? He was giving a summary of what he did while he was there. When he was planting the church, it was actually a summary statement of his mission work in Corinth. It's actually describing, if you, if you want to know how to do mission work, just listen. It's about Jesus and crucified. You don't have to be clever and wise. You, know, you don't have to be the most gifted rhetorical preacher. Like, just tell it simply and God will back it up. And then, you know, the second passage that was important, it's, it's even more, it's even clearer. And Paul says, and that's the last letter of his we got in, 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 uh, in the Bible, the letter to the Rome, Paul summarizes his entire mission activity in those verses. He said, look, I lead the Gentiles to obey God by, by what I've said and done. So I preach and then stuff happens. The power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Elycrium, I fully proclaim the gospel of Christ. So if you want to do mission work, if you want to proclaim the gospel of Christ, how do you do it? The simple word of Jesus. And allow God to back it up. Yeah, that, I got that. The problem was that I didn't know anyone that was doing ministry that way. Maybe you could find people on YouTube and read a book about stuff. But not, not in Toowoomba, like I've never been. That, that, you know, usually the idea was if you preach a really, really, really good sound sermon, it's going to do the job. Only it's not doing the job. Because you, you, you may preach as cleverly as you want on the Trinity. It just still doesn't make sense to the human reason. You know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're three, but no, they're really one. Three, one. And then one of them is God as well, fully God, but he becomes a human being. So suddenly he's fully God and fully human being. So, but he's God, he's an immortal, God uh, immortal, but he dies. And then after three days he's raised up. To, like, you can be as clever and learned as you want about that. You can quote heaps of other books. Unless God backs it up, it's not intelligible. You can understand it, but it's not convincing unless actually God demonstrates his power and, and moves on the message. So I, did, I didn't know anyone that was doing it this way, but someone offered us a tent for outreach, and he offered us the tent for free, and there was a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a journey. But, so finally we did tent evangelism. Good old Lutherans. N- n- never actually seen it in action other people doing it, but so we had our tent in Queen's Park, and we wanted to do it this way, which is, oh, it's scary for all of us, because, you know, the preaching is fine, you, you can have a manuscript, if, if, if you get too scared by people looking at you, you can actually read it, or hide behind it, you say, I mean, sit down, you are a little bit in control, but with this one, eventually you've got to be finished with what, speaking, and then it's God's turn to do something, and what if God doesn't do anything? That's always, what if God doesn't do anything? You know, you step out and you pray for healing, or you, you step out and do something, and then God is not really coming on board. Um, so I was a little bit struggling with boldness, and then I thought, well, we, we seem to have a stopgap miracle that always seems to happen. And that was for the last three years at the time, Every time we had worship, every time we prayed for it, every time we checked, we had these gold sparkles on, this, on, on our skin. Someone would always have it. So even today, if you want to check later on, sunlight, whatever, or with the phone, someone's got it. So I thought, well, you got it already? Yeah, yeah, so hooray. Hey, this is a great miracle. So, oh, okay, so 
there are a few people already. But this one seemed to be utterly reliable. And I thought, well, if nothing else happens in the tent, I'm sure this one is going to be there. And so we gave it a go. And uh, the tent was amazing. Like, people got healed every day. Like, God actually went out of his way to just make sure everyone got healed. One guy got healed just by coming closer to the tent. Like, he, he actually realized, you know, for a few days he walks past the tent. And so he realized, oh, if I get closer to the tent, I feel better. My condition is getting better. And when he was leaving the tent again, going on, it, it came back, got worse. So he, he does that for a few days until he ca- finally comes in. And then he gets healed in the tent. I mean, is that a good story? That's a good story. I, I move on. So there, there are lots of... No, I give you one more. It's just an encouragement. So God is amazing. We do that for four days. The fifth day, uh, every day we had demonic manifestations as well, which we didn't see coming. Like... I liked it. Like I, I said, I liked the wider meetings. Like, um, but from then on, we had an extra tent to, where we can just, you know, m- more in privacy, but it was good fun. But, you know, the last um, night, there was this demonic stuff happening all over the church, all over the whoever was there, and I was already a little bit stressed because, you know, I saw Lutherans there and just like... I. I I couldn't believe that people were not completely freaked out and distressed by it. So it's almost like they didn't see it. But, you know, it was noisy, it was a bit wild, and, and we didn't quite get, in the worship, we didn't qu- quite break through into the presence of God like the previous nights. And there was a reason for it, because the Satanists or, you know, the guys from the other camp, they were outside the tent, maybe 40 meters back, they were cursing and fire twirling, and just the atmosphere got a little bit heavier. So... All of this was going on, and then I, I was going up to preach, and there was a guy sitting there in a wheelchair. That looks like an invitation for healing. So and I asked him, you know, why did he come? And the only reason he was there, because he wanted prayer for healing. So I said, you know, if he got the courage to come for that, I got the courage to pray for him. So just imagine it. So the worship, we didn't quite get there. The atmosphere was a bit heavier. We had all these demonic stuff happening there. And now I'm going to pray for someone in the wheelchair, and I've never seen that healed before. And like, but I'm, I'm, I'm going by the book, right? I do the simple stuff, and God, surely, it's his turn to back it up. So I do it, and I'm a little bit excited about that. But he didn't get healed. Like, just when you need God to come through, and, so, and, and like you feel like, God, I told you that I didn't want to look stupid. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not like we didn't give it a good chance. It wasn't just a quick prayer. Like, you know, this guy, his right side was completely lame. So, basically, I pray for him and say, oh, come on, take a few steps. You know, act faith. And, like, basically, this is how he does it. And I made him the entire stage. I made him all the way. Because on YouTube, you can see it. Any moment, he would strengthen and walk, right? So, like, it wasn't my fault that he had to do the whole lap. Like, any moment, God could have just... And done. And then I preach. But it didn't quite happen. Because I made him one lap a second lap, a third one, and then we gave him a bit of water. <laughs> and then he came back, then we let him rest. We, we prayed for ages, and after the meeting as well, and then, oh, well, after, uh, you know, I don't know, for ages, he sat down, and I thought, hmm, it didn't quite work like it should, except that I knew... I remembered the name of his father-in-law, and during the week I googled his name, I found a phone number, I actually caught up with the man, and on Sunday he walked in here. So, amen! Great! Good! Wonderful! But, in my humble opinion, God got the timing wrong. (laughs) I'm just saying it, that 
you know, as wonderful as that was, and this is actually the way God is doing ministry, we are not in control, and God still doesn't mind to make us look a little bit foolish every now and then. Even though I probably just felt foolish on the night, everyone else probably thought, it's okay. Sometimes we get a bit too self-conscious. And God has a way of breaking that down. So I wrote then the second book here, Surprised by Miracles. You know, that happened with the gold sparkles. We didn't pray for them. They were surprised. Lots of surprises. And then what surprised me even more is that when the miracles finally came, not everyone was happy about them. Like the Christians, the Pentecostals were not happy about I remember, I remember a phone call, a Pentecostal minister became a Lutheran in the denomination. And so, you know, we knew each other from a distance. And so I'm, I'm on the... I'm on the phone and he says, oh, Edgar, you know, like, I really speak up for you and, like, you know, I'm in your corner. And, but, but, you know, the gold sparkles, oh, that puts you on the lunatic fringe of the Pentecostal movement. <laughs> the lunatic fringe. <laughs> he, so I had to write a book. <laughs> the lunatic fringe. And there are, you know, one of the questions is always asked, you know, where is that in the Bible? Gold sparkles. Where is that in the Bible? Or feathers falling from the ceiling. Where is that in the Bible? Or supernatural rain within the, inside the worship building. Where is that in the Bible? You know, the Bible says God is free to do something new if he wants to. The Bible says that Jesus performed so many miracles and not all, even all the books in the world can contain them. So... Um, and I was a bit surprised when I did, um, you know, study. All the scholars say Jesus died on the cross because he was cleansing the temple and he stuck out his neck a bit too far. He caused a bit of a disturbance and everyone was a bit worried about, you know, the Romans. They didn't want, you know, messiah, messianic hope to spring up. And so in order to quell any, any agitation there, you know, they killed him. But that's not what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? What killed Jesus? Yeah, like, yeah, there's a deeper reason behind it, but what tr his opposition, what triggered them and pushed them over the line to finally resolve to kill Jesus? Because the miracles. And it's not just one verse. And, like, if you've never seen a miracle, you don't see these verses because they don't fit your world. But when suddenly you become open for them, the miracles are everywhere and God is using them. And, you know, this book is a bit about all about that and, you know, different way people respond to it. What would need to happen for you to perform one yourself? You know, all of that. So, so I've done all of that, the first two um, books. And then I discovered that it wasn't about that at all. You know, we were in the Lutheran church and... I always thought that people didn't understand the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And that is the big discussion point. And then I thought, ah, it's the miracles. They don't get that. And so you've got to explain that. And then I finally realized, you know, years into, down into that journey, that's not where the problem is. The problem that I identified right early on is that you are in a church, you have a kind of faith where there is no experience of God. None. And that points to the problem. When do, you have, when do you have your first experience of God? You may have a few before, but definitely by then. When do you actually experience God? When you get saved. When you get born again. By the Spirit, you become someone new and then you, you know things open up to us and basically i was dealing with people that no longer even knew what it means to be born again and then i discovered as well that this is not a rare phenomenon it's it's like you know if i asked you you know what how do you get saved you can answer very quickly you say ah oh, you know you just put your faith in jesus christ and that's reckoned to you as righteousness and you're, you're forgiven. 
It's not by works, it's just by believing and trusting Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's not that complicated, but the church throughout history has managed to lose that knowledge of what that actually is again and again. So Luther's time. <laughs> you know, he's, he, no one knew and no one could teach it. It was universally lost. And then um, you take 200 years down the track, John and Charles Wesley in, in England stayed like they were Anglican ministers and had no clue whatsoever what it means to be born again. It was completely forgotten knowledge in the church. And then, you know, the ministry of Charles Finney and, you know, you, you just name it. It's always the same problem. That even the people sitting in the church don't know what it means to be saved because they think they know, but they don't. Because they have no experience of God. And you cannot be a Christian unless you actually really encounter God. Like, according to um, Stanley Jones, last century, you know, he's been everywhere, traveled all across the world, he would say, that's his estimate, two-thirds of all people in church don't know this. They're not born again, which basically means they're not saved. That's a bit radical, would you say? So I've written the third one. And some would say, maybe that's the first one I should, should have written, but you know, the first part is uh, stuff on unity. There's a few interesting things there. But the second half is all about experiencing God and how that actually recovering actually the, knowing the experience that happens when you get born again. Um, yeah, like... Uh, I preached long enough, so... Um, um, I usually like to tell Tatiana's story, you know, when she came to faith, because I was right there. And, you know, when she wanted to come to faith, all her friends, good Christians, passionate for Jesus and whatever, they... They counseled her and asked her all the questions like, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you believe that he died for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. So she had all the knowledge and then they said, you're saved. And Tatiana said, no, I'm not. And so there was a bit of an argument going on until she finally gets to the preacher and the preacher checks out and simply prays a simple prayer you know, that uh, God would just give her the Holy Spirit and just make her know she's a Christian or something like that. The Holy Christian would come. And then the Holy Spirit did come on her. And from one moment to the next, she knew that she knew she was born again. She was a Christian and belonged to God. And the joy would come upon her. And, you know, in, in our own you know, Lutheran confessions or Reformation writings, it says the inexperienced don't know this. They think it's easy. And they think it's easy because it's just a bit of head knowledge, a system, something you learn. But the inexperienced just haven't got a clue because you learn it by experience that when God starts talking to you, he convicts you of sin and of a separation from God. He, 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 he calls you into relationship with him. And then when you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gives you the joy of salvation, peace with God. That's an experience to be, have peace with God an experience to be a little bit agitated because you're not right with God, but then it's also an experience to be comforted and knowing that you belong to Him. That's what it means to be born again, and unless you, you learn that by experience, you haven't got it. Agreed? Okay, so what about today? So I said experiencing God is a top value in the church top value in our church. So if you have a Sunday service where we're not encountering God, that's when I go home unhappy. Is that a value that is easily maintained or is it easily lost? It's easily lost. And why is it easily lost? Here we go, free will. And it's like, you know, I told you the history of the church and like it took a little bit of energy to live all of that and learn all of that, and there was lots of resistance. And you know, from a human point of view, you couldn't be blamed of saying, "Oh, I fought long and hard and enough. I just want to have just sit for a while and not do anything." 
you know, just rest on your laurels a little bit or, you know, on the, your past history and just like, God, I'm, I'm tired of engage, engaging you, sitting back. Does it ring a bell? It does. You can get weary and you can just fall back and it's a lot easier. And it's, instead of being fully engaged, you know, your heart, mind, soul, emotions, everything engaged, uh, let's just watch a little bit TV and come to church on time and then go home again. It's just, so it, it takes a little bit of effort. But I thought, ah, oh, this morning I don't want to really preach about effort because it is easy to get weary. Especially if you're still children that go to school and you've got to drive them everywhere and you've got to make a living and this and that. and every, Everything seems to want your time. But to experience and encounter God, he, he wants priority. So how do you do that? So I'm not giving you an answer to all of that except to say that we are, that's our value and we are pursuing it. I want to go back to what Sarah did in the beginning. And there's a Bible verse in Ephesians 5. And Dirk, in the prayer meeting before the church, he referred to that as well. He said, the Bible says, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. By doing what? By talking to one another in songs and psalms and spiritual you know, things. And by giving thanks to God, praising Him in all circumstances. So I thought, we've done that before. The preaching, we do it now. Maybe just another song. This is not too hard. You can do it when you're weary. You're just praising. You don't have to fast. You don't have to press in. You just praise Him. You thank Him for all circumstances right now. And you just lift up His holy name. And the promise is, this is the key to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and this Holy Spirit comes. You know, the lightness, the joy, the peace comes. And just a way to go. Amen.